Hello. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, welcoming you to the ICS live webinar today. Uh, my name is Sharif Murad. I'm professor of urology at Shams University from Cairo, Egypt. We're going to take today about the anatomic tips and tricks of female functional urologic surgery, life and cadaveric surgery for this uh, topic. Before the panel introduce themselves, please make sure you post any questions you have for us in the comment section below, and we will get to them as we go along. I would like today to introduce two valuable mentors and, and friends. Uh, you are very well known to you. Emery Huri from Turkey and Alex Degisu from UK. Would you please introduce yourself, guys? Thank you so much, Sheriff. I am Emre Huri from Ankara, Turkey. I am uh, working at Hacettepe University, Faculty of Medicine Department of Urology as Associate Professor of Urology. I'm Director of ICS School of Modern Technology. It's great pleasure uh, to be invited by ICS office. Thank you so much. Hello everyone, my name is Alex Dijesu. I'm a consultant urogynecologist specialist and I work at Imperial College in London. I am so I'm honored and delighted to be part of this faculty and I hope you all enjoy will enjoy this webinar. Excellent. So we will start now with Dr. Emery Huri to start his presentation, please Emery. Thank you so much, Sheriff. Um, now we are starting with education-based female urologic surgery uh, in terms of the cadaveric 3D medical printing and simulation models. Actually, I would like to stress the knowing the importance of anatomic structures and their functional priority for the best female urologic surgery. And we know that the abnormality in anatomy and the functional structures may can cause the clinical symptoms, especially incontinence and especially the stress urinary incontinence that will be affected by this uh, disintegrity of the anatomy and the function. The urinary incontinence, we know that it can be defined as involuntary urine leakage with the prevalence of the between 10 to 60%. And only stress urinary incontinence can be said to be the surgically curable. So in particular, a healthy pelvic floor plays a role in prevention of stress urinary incontinence. So we need to know the exact anatomy of the pelvic floor to, while, while we treat the uh, stress urinary incontinence. Pelvic floor has two anatomical features. The first one is static and the, the second one, the dynamic anatomy. So just take a look in female gender. There is an, uh, then only the muscle layer, especially at the bottom of the pelvic floor uh, and uh, the base of the abdomen. And it's surrounded by the bone support, includes the sacrum and the ileum, ischium, pubic ramus, and the coccyx. And within the pelvic bones, the, the static anatomy components includes the pelvis with organs and also the connective tissues, which are the urethra, bladder, vagina, and the rectum at the posterior side. Especially, we need to know that the important connective tissues, which are also the ligaments and the fascial layers, uh, provides the dynamic anatomy uh, the, the each of us, the, the one of the member of the static anatomy, especially the pubocervical fascia at the anterior side uh, between the anterior uh, urethra, the posterior level of the urethra and the, the vagina and the posterior side, the rectovaginal fascia. This picture shows the components involved in transition from the static to dynamic anatomy, includes the bone, the pubic symphysis at the anterior uh, border, at the posterior as a sacrum, and the suspensory ligaments uh, the, at the anterior level, the puboureteral and the pubovesical ligaments, and uh, continues with the laterally arcus tendineus fascia pelvis, called as the white line, at the posterior side, the uterus sacral ligament, and the, between the uterus and the sacrum. However, the muscle forces provided by the pubococcygeal muscles, puborectalis muscle, and the levator plate, and with the supported fascia, especially the two important fascial layers, pubocervical fascia and the rectovaginal fascia with the perineal structures. 
I would like to stress the importance of the perineal body. This is the point of the balance, especially for pelvic floor. I, uh, the balance between the muscles and the ligaments are crucial to maintain the, uh, the, the, the continence in female. For active closure, this diagram shows the how three muscle forces stretch and close the urethra and the bladder neck. Pubococcygeal muscle, the levator plate, and the longitudinal muscle of anus. For micturation, there is an, uh, the, it shows how the two muscle forces, the levator plate and the longitudinal muscle of anus, open up the urethra and the, while the pubococcygeal muscles relaxes. So this is the healthy urethra uh, position for micturation. The in pelvic functional integrity, uh, there are two main parts, the nerves, the fascial layers, and the vasculatures are important, especially for the functions of the female pelvic organs. Uh, when you think about the pathophysiology of the stress incontinence, these three important anatomic factors include the healthy and the functioning situated sphincter controlled by the nerve, which is the pudental innervation, and the urethral mucosa and the submucosal well vascularized, and also intrinsic urethral smooth muscle, which is located at the bladder neck, and the intact, intact vaginal wall support, which, uh, which is covered by the fascial layers. The perineal body, you can uh, examine, at the, especially at the perineal spaces, at the point between the urogenital and the anal, an, anal trigon, it uh, provides the balance between the middle and the posterior compartment of the pelvic side. However, as I mentioned previously, arcus tendinus fascia pelvis, or the white line, important anatomic landmark, especially while we do the TOT or the TVT procedure. At the medial part of the uh, white line is important anatomic size, for, especially for TVT. At the lateral includes the transobturator uh, uh, surgical area, includes uh, the, the provided the obturator foramen. So this is important to, to attach of the pubovaginal cervical fascia located at the uh, one something below of the pubic bone directly towards the ischial spine. As a summary, from outside to inside, I would like to show the pelvic support. The pelvic diaphragma covered the urethra, vagina, and the rectum together, and the perineal membrane covered the urethra and the vagina. And the, the superficial layer yeah, in urogenital trigon includes the consists the ischiocavernous muscle, bulbous spongiosis muscle, transversus perineus superficialis, and in deep layer in urogenital trigon covered by the transversus perineus profundus. Inside, the more inside the pelvic, you can see the pelvic diaphragma uh, as the laterally arcus tendineus and the whole pelvic diaphragma uh, covered by the levator ani muscle group not only one. And then more inside, you can see the rectum at the anterior of the rectum, rectovaginal fascia, the vaginal uh, anatomic location, and the puposorical fascia covered uh, all, uh, all uh, the, the posterior side of the bladder between the um, vagina and the, uh, the urethra and the bladder, and then uh, the cardinal ligament, the uterosacral ligament, and then all functional layer can be seen. Now, I would like to stress the importance of the 3D models, especially for education purpose. The 3D models are used in education for a better understanding of the complex female anatomy. The human body, the cadaveric corpse, the 3D printing model, 3D simulation are important for our aims for surgical training, medical education, and surgical planning and patient education. However, the, path, uh, the important issue, the weakening of this anatomical formation is an important factor in stress type urinary incontinence. Therefore, the surgical procedures that mimic the anatomy formations are planned in the performed surgery. We can start with the TOT trocar application because I know that the, the sheriff will explain the live cases, especially for TOT procedures. I summarize in 10 steps. This is the, this is the cadaveric experience of our group. The first, the mid urethral vaginal incision can be done, and the dissection of the pubocervical fascia, and the, the blunt dissection with the index finger to prepare the paravaginal space in fresh frozen uh, cadaver towards the obturator fossa, and to, to, to determination of the, the puncture of the in groin level, uh, reflection of the obturator fossa. The clitoris is important anatomic landmark also in cadaver and uh, doing the groin incision for the trocar placement, the guiding the TOT trocar with the index finger of the tip of the index finger and the getting the trocar out through the vaginal incision 
and of course the checking the vaginal wall for uh, for uh, for uh, for probable perforation. And on cadaveric experience, we can check inside the pelvic region, especially at the obturator foramen site, for potential complications, and we can see if the if the complications can occur. Especially for uh, the beginner of the res learning curve, it's important. Maybe we can go in deeply for obturator fossa dissection, then we can see uh, the path of the anterior trochars. I would like to summarize the path, the anatomic location, especially from outside to, the, uh, to inside the directly vaginal towards. The first of all, the gracilis muscle. Uh, and we puncture the adductor brevis muscle, obturator externus muscle, obturator membrane, and obturator internus muscle, arcus tendineus facius pelvis, the paravesical space, and we take the trocar out while vesicovaginal spaces. And here uh, I would like to show the one of the uh, video for cadaveric experiences, and then this can be good example for uh, for the how the fresh frozen cadaver is suitable for the dissection. Uh, especially for education purposes. And following the insertion of the folate catheter, then we can check the balloon and also the, the potential anatomic important landmarks, ischiopubic ramus, and also to use the, the, to, the surgical tools while we use in the live surgery. And it's also ready for the anterior vagin vaginal wall dissection. In anterior vaginal wall dissection, this is important to see the pubocervical fascia, so to cut the fascia and to make the uh, index finger dissection when we do the surgical uh, procedures on cadavers. So I would like to stress the importance of the cadaveric experience for before the starting the life procedure for this uh, aim. What about the TVT trocar application procedure? I summarized it in six steps for you. The preparation of the anterior vaginal, vaginal wall will be the same as the OT procedure, and then preparation as the same. But the different uh, from the TOT, we are preparing our index finger with the, the retropubic space, and the, we, it's important to deviate the bladder medially to prepare the retropubic space for trocar application. The guiding the trocar with finger to pass behind the retropubic space, and then you can see it's the bigger and the longer and the wider trocar compared to TOT procedure. And then we can check if we perforate uh, the fascia or, or any other dual complication, so we can discuss it during the cadaveric surgery. Here, this is the routine uh, outside to inside the needle root, and the exiting from the pubic surface of the abdominal skin is crucial. And this is the uh, right way when we do the surgery. Uh, of course, the trying the potential complications during the surgery is crucial while cadaveric dissection. If we move the trocar medially, we can harm and the, the bladder damage. And also the cephalic move can, pro, uh, can cause the bowel damage and lateral move can cause the vascular damage. So the cadaveric experience help, will be helpful for to improve your surgical skills and the hands-on training. This is the one of the potential complications of the bubble injury. Then you see the uh, for the TV, TVT procedure and the, the, the throw card goes directly to, into the bubble. Yes, the, and also we can use some camera assisted 3D vision uh, to see better visualization. And following the cadaveric surgery, just I would like to stress the importance of the 3D prudent pelvic models. And these models are uh, created by the patient specific data and the all materials was printed uh, with, by medical 3D printed. And this, paper, uh, this uh, trial showed us comparison of the cadaveric or the, the 3D printed model uh, uh, for TOT procedure. At the end, we can say the 3D printed models are effective as much as cadaveric models for surgical skill training, but still the cadaveric models are better, especially for anatomy learning. And finally, I would like to show some uh, two videos. That is the research facility uh, of, uh, of the uh, cystoscopy model and the Botox injection model. The virtual reality applications gain, of course, importance in female urologic surgery training and the usefulness and the realistic uh, approach and the, the overall satisfactions are important for that. And then this is also important uh, to use the cystoscopy model. And uh, this video showed the Botox application 
uh, especially intravesical Botox application, the research we are facility, and the DVR system developed the uh, urologists and residents will enable systematic training. And it provides the increasing the dexterity, user's dexterity, and the, the, the surgeon can do the uh, Botox injection application at the right uh, point, at the right site. And then you can check also uh, with the debriefing system how you succeed or not. So this is the feature of the training for injections for the surgical procedures for open surgeries, then you can see there is a change in color, especially if you do the, uh, if you do the uh, Botox injection at the right side. And uh, this, is the, this will be helpful for, uh, for trainee to do the surgery the best. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your attention. Uh, all uh, you can uh, see in our ICS course that will be held in 5 to 6 November in 2020, uh, 2020 in Istanbul. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Emery, for this excellent view of the <coughs> pelvic uh, anatomy. And now I think that will go more clinical. So I will be presenting the transobturative tapes for stress urinary incontinence. This is like uh, teaching uh, slides. So this is mainly directed to our young uh, urogynecologists who will be interested to know better about the procedure. <coughs> uh, okay. So this is the, uh, the conflict of interest uh, for myself. Uh, I want to start with saying that the urethra is, when the urethra is hypermobile, the urethra loses its water tight seal and urine leakage occurs. And the bladder sling acts like a hammock underneath the urethra to provide support underneath this urethra. QOT sling and the TVT sling are the most common types of bladder slings. The TOT sling and the TVT sling have almost wiped out every other uh, surgical incontinence procedure in the last 50 years. They became very popular in this, and this is how it looks like for the suprapubic approach. And this is the typical TVT. And this is the transobturator approach. As you can, and you know it. So surgeons currently use a number of materials for constructing pubovaginal slings with excellent outcomes. Serious complications from the sling surgery are reported, but uncommon, but they, they became like a very important issue in some of the countries. So the choice of sling material and sling surgery is predominantly one of surgery preference. The condition of the host fascia or the host tissue and, and the previous surgery are very important to decide upon the procedure. The ideal sling material to use and the method of fixation are controversial. So the ideal tape material should resist infection, easily incorporated to surrounding tissue, must be histological well tolerated, minimal post-insertion shrinkage and have an optimal elasticity. The ideal tape material is usually synthetic, uh, knitted uh, polypropylene, monofilament, macroporous, and of lightweight. This is a subfacial hammock concept of urethral support described by Delancey. Usually normal pubo-urethral ligaments form a sort of sub hammock of support. So that's why the woman, when, uh, had, when she exerts downward force against this hammock, it will cause urethral compression and prevents bladder neck descent. The TOT, or transoperative tape, subfacial hammock, restores anatomical pubirystral ligament support because it mimics the same pathway of this uh, ligament. So you can see even here that the TOT in the red line mimics the normal pubirystral ligament in the green uh, color. And this is, again, the comparison of uh, the pubovaginal sling, which is the dotted line, the direction is going uh, retropubically, and the TOT with the solid lines. The obturator anatomy is very important, and I think that Dr. Emery already uh, denoted the anatomy very well in his slides, and it is important to know well about the obturator foramen. The rationale 
for the transoperator approach is to avoid the retropubic space, which reduces the risk of perforation to the bladder, bowel, or major pelvic vessels. The hammock shape mesh with lateral fixation will mimic the normal pubic support as described. What are the advantages of TOT over TVT? That it avoids the retropubic area with lower risk of uh, bowel or bladder injury. Shorter operating time, of course, and sometimes no need for cystoscopy, especially if you are performing the outside in technique. These are the steps of the outside in technique. They put, they make the incision, then you dissect towards the pubic rami, and you, with your finger, you touch the bone and you feel it very well, and then you introduce your needle very uh, adjacent to the bony edge. Sorry. And then you fix the tapes, take the tapes out from uh, bilaterally, and you have very minimal tension on the urethra, and then you cut the rest of the tapes, and that's it. So what are the difference between inside out versus outside in? According to systematic reviews of randomized clinical trials, or with 12 months follow-up and another with three year follow-up, the patient reported success rate of around 73.1% with no significant difference between the inside and outside technique in technique. So this is okay for everyone to choose which technique he prefers and that's uh, what he can master. And the results are almost the same. The obturator, uh, the needle insertion uh, will start along the medial edge of the ischiopubic ramus just below the insertion of the adductor longus tendon, which is approximately at the level of the clitoris. So as you can see that the green area is the safe entry zone for the needle insertion. It's very important to be careful about this. Again, this green area is the uh, needle entry pathway. So we have to look to have uh, the vision from both the, I mean, uh, plans to, to make sure that you are putting your needle tip in the proper plane. This is again showing the same. So the needle tip will perforate the, when you do it outside in, will perforate the obturator externus muscle, then the obturator membrane, obturator internus muscle, then the periurethral endopelvic fascia and exit through the vaginal incision. These are some demonstration of the procedure. You can use general spinal or local anesthesia. And this is, uh, this video is showing the local anesthetic injections. And then you need to do or to make a 1.2 to 2 centimeter incision along the anterior vaginal wall, mucosa, half centimeter distant from the meatus. So, you need to make the incision in a way uh, that can pass your finger inside to dissect. The vaginal epithelium is then dissected off the underlying periurethral fascia. You need to dissect bilaterally to the inferior pubic ramus. Then introduce your fingertip to make sure that the dissection is completed and you can reach the medial edge of the bone. Identify the internal edge of the obturator foramen from inside and outside to make sure that you will put the needle in the proper direction. Make another skin incision in or just medial to the genital femoral fold at the base of the adductor longus tendon, approximately at the level of the clitoris again. Then you pass the tip of, your, of the needle through this incision towards the tip of, the of your finger inside. This is, this is uh, the trick of this uh, technique from outside in so that you get the tip of the needle to the uh, tip of your finger. So you make sure that you are not transfixing, transfixing the bladder. So this is the direction of the needle. And it is important to hit the tip of your finger and you get it outside safely without transfixion or without injuring any other organ. 
Well, now, and now it's just getting out of the vagina very safe. Now we put the mesh, uh, at, uh, I mean, <clears throat> make the attachment of the mesh to the needle tip and then pull the needle back the same direction and the tape will come out from one side and then from the other side as well. Usually all these steps in uh, the well-trained hands will not take more than 10 minutes from the incision. So it is an easy procedure, usually very safe. And you just attach the mesh again and get it outside. Then you have both ends ready now outside. Need to leave a small space between the urethra and the mesh. You can insert the tip of the scissor or pickup and do make very soft tension and then remove the cheese and cut or trim the, the mesh and get it out and then close these molds. And that's it. Okay. So it's a very easy procedure and very safe doing it outside in. I want to show you this 3D CT scanning that we have been using it to study our uh, post-operative cases. And as you can see that these are, uh, I mean, successful cases and the patient became dry after this with no incontinence. And you can see that the urethra is just straight with no uh, kinking, which means that the, the tape should not kink the urethra in the relaxing position but the, the, the urethra start to be compressed through the tape during the uh, cuffing or straining. But usually the tape should not be uh, tense to kink the urethra to avoid erosion. The comorbidities increase with uh, incidence, uh, I mean, of diabetes or vascular lesion, increases with obesity and previous irradiation for pelvic cancers, for example. So, you have to be careful about these comorbidities and you have to counsel the patient and tell, tell them about the expected complications. These are some of the complications of the TOT, uh, the interoperative complication, including clinical significant bleeding and hematomas, bladder, urethra, vaginal wall perforation, bowel or nerve injury. Postoperatively, there might be urinary tract infection, mesh erosion, which is the, the most serious, do no urgency or post-operative voiding dysfunction. And you can see here some of these complications like sling erosions. And this shows uh, vaginal <coughs> erosion again here. Bladder perforation, urethral erosion, very uh, bad scarring tissue and urethral perforation also here again. Scarred vagina in the bladder neck area, maybe after recurrent cases. Eurohematoma, 24 hours post TBT, with bladder perforation. And this is another hematoma that happened 72 hours. And this is a huge one, really scary. We have to be careful about all these complications because, uh, I mean, if, even if the procedure is easy, but sometimes there are some bad complications. And here is complete urethral loss after the sling procedure. Erosions and erosions and erosions. The possible etiology of this may be inadequate covering of the mesh from the beginning, or maybe due to subclinical infection or friction to surrounding tissue. So all the precautions and instructions should be given to the ladies before the operation and after the operation to make sure that they have all the instruction there and to detect any early complication. The treatment option could be local antibiotics and estrogen or to cover the sling with vaginal flap if there's minimal erosion or partial removal of the sling or maybe total resection of the sling material if you have the sling exposed and there's sign of chronic infection or irritation. So all these options are uh, available and you can choose which of them according to the case. So it is very important to identify the erosion as early as you can. Examine the patient every time she comes for the follow-up. Look at the erosion or 
uh, try to do transaction early to make sure that the, the complication is not extending more. And it is important to do good planning for using meshes. The most consistently reported of all vaginal mesh complications and side effects, according to the FDA, has been the erosion. This is the worst complication that you can see. So the mesh or the sling wears through the vaginal mucosa, exposing its rough and uncomfortable surface to the patient and her partner. Make sure to look uh, carefully for the patient and to make sure that the wound is clear and the vaginal tissues are healthy. So the take home message is to look for erosions at every vis visit. Look at the vaginal discharge or any blood loss, dyspareunia or pain or fever. And these are some alarming symptoms. Eliminate infections if it exists. Give local estrogen and wait for healing if, uh, if she needs. And if nothing helps, revise the mesh. Thank you very much for your attention. And now I will give uh, the chance to Alex to start his presentation. Alex. Thank you, Sharif. And uh, now oh, we move to the uh, different subjects. So, so far we have covered the surgical treatment of stress urinary incontinence. Now we move to the surgical treatment of uterine prolapse. And I'm going to talk about laparoscopic sacroisteropexy. In the next 15 minutes, I'm going to uh, show the way as I do this technique to treat uterine prolapse by using a monofilament polypropylene tape covered by titanium to suspend the uterus uh, to the sacral promontory without barring the mesh underneath of the peritoneum. Therefore, I'm going to explain the rationale why I feel it is a safe uh, surgical approach not to bury the mesh underneath of the peritoneum. I'm going to show you the surgical step as well as the anatomical landmark that everyone who's performing any type of surgery should bear in mind in order to avoid any intra and post-operative complication. These are my conflict of interest. As you can see, I'm sitting in different committees in both a UGA and ICS. I'm both associate editor of the Neurology Eurodynamic and the IUJ. Well, I start performing this procedure, laparoscopic sacroisteropexy, to suspend the uterus of the sacral promontory about 15 years ago when the number of women with uterine prolapse requiring and requesting a uterine preservation was increasing. It was increasing because of the age, because religion, reason, cultural reason, or also the belief that doing a vaginal hysterectomy or an hysterectomy might have an impact on their quality of life or sexual function. Therefore, I start looking in the literature what will be the best procedure, how to perform this procedure, and I found different surgical approach different mesh were used. I started using uh, performing a few uh, procedures, but none of the procedure I was doing have all ever convinced me because in my opinion, the best uh, surgical technique is the one which is effective, is safe, but is easy to perform, easy to teach, easy to learn for our fellow. So I start thinking, well, if I have to suspend the uterus to the circular promontory using a mesh, do I really need to do all the dissection of the patch peritoneum or the patch of Douglas? Do I really need to bury that mesh? So I start thinking probably I don't need to bury the mesh, but my main worry was the uh, reported complication such as erosion or extrusion of the mesh into the surrounding organs. Well, while I was looking in the literature, I found this interesting study. This is a UK study performing for hospital where 128 women when, uh, were treated by sacroisteropexy or sacrocolpopexy where the monofilament uh, polypropylene mesh was used to suspend the vault and the uterus to the sacral promontory without covering the mesh underneath of the peritoneum. This was a two years follow up study and the conclusion where there were no associated or reported complications. Therefore, these authors, this was a multi center trial, uh, concluded that it appeared to be safe to perform a suspension without closing the peritoneum on top of the mesh. 
Then if I accept that that can be a good approach to perform, I start looking which one will be the best uh, surgical material to use, which mesh I should use. And I found uh, this consensus statement from the Association of Coloproctology of UK, where uh, the guideline were suggesting to use a monofilament a polypropylene lightweight mesh, which is covered by titanium to uh, used to perform a ventral rectopexy. So I ask myself, well, if the colorectal surgeon are attaching uh, this type of mesh on the rectum and they are no worry about erosion, why I should not attach my mesh on the uterus? Well, the advantage of the titanium, uh, what are the advantages? The titanium is one of the most biocompatible material, which normally transform the material surface from hydrophobic to hydrophilic. And by doing that, reduce inflammatory reaction. If I'm able to reduce inflammatory reaction, I reduce the scar tissue formation. If I reduce the scar tissue formation, I reduce the risk of complication, therefore the pain, and therefore is uh, quicker the uh, going back to the normal activity. This is the mesh that I normally use. I don't have any conflict of interest with the uh, manufacturer. This is a white tape. It's 20 centimeter, 21 centimeter long, a three centimeter wide. It's a monofilament suture, larger pore, and the thickness of the titanization layer is about 30 to 50 nanometers. The uh, suture end are laser cut. It has been designed for the treatment of intraperitoneal as well as extraperitoneal hernias and is an, is an excellent biocompatible material, as I mentioned to you, because reduce the inflammation rates, reduce the scar tissue inflammation, reduce the pain, and the shrinkage is minimal if you use a titanium cover mesh with, compared to a non-titanium mesh. As you can see, the shrinkage varies from 20% if I use a titanium cover mesh to 40%, more than double, if I use a monofilament tape uh, or mesh not covered by titanium. This mesh has been uh, used for, as I mentioned to you, the treatment of intraperitoneal and extraperitoneal hernia, prevention incisional hernia, parastomal hernia, soft tissue reinforcement, rectopexy, as well as reconstructive breast surgery. The next step, I start looking, I said, before I use this technique, I want to better understand, I want to improve my knowledge whether or not uh, it is actually safe in both animal study and human study. Let's look at the animal study. This is an interesting study on uh, animals. Pig were used as animal, and the authors, they implanted 20 pigs using this mesh intraperitoneal. They've done the autopsy after two to 25 days. And as you can see that I, what their authors found that the mesh was completely peritonalized, was completely covered by peritoneum. So it peritonized by itself. This slide showed that the shrinkage was minimal. And in this other study, the author confirmed that there was a minimal scar formation surrounding the mesh. What about the human study? This human study, the author studied 45 patients with abdominal hernia. They repaired the hernia using intraperitoneal repair using this mesh, and they concluded that there were no complications, no mesh removal needed. So it looks to be a safe treatment. This is another single center randomized control trial, two years follow up where patients were randomized between using titanium cove mesh versus a polyester composite mesh to treat hernia. And again, the author concluded that there was no difference in this efficacy of the two meshes, the two group, but those patients who had a titanium cover mesh had less post-operative pain, lower analgesic consumption, a quicker return to the everyday activities, because again, by using this mesh, we reduce the inflammatory process, we reduce the risk of pain and so on. And all these advantages have been summarized and confirmed by the systematic review and meta-analysis where all the randomized control trials where the, co the titanium cover mesh were being compared to other mesh, as you can see, the titanium cover mesh uh, caused less inflammation, less foreign body reaction, has a better biocompatibility and less pain. Now, this is a video that uh, is has been performed on um, 
animal is an animal study where as you can see the uh, the mesh has been implanted inside the abdominal cavity and this is three months later we perform another laparoscopy as you can see the mesh is completely covered by peritoneum so you don't need to cover by to put the mesh underneath of the peritoneum because this mesh will cover itself uh, this is obviously an animal study, and then let's move on uh, a human study. I did the same thing on some patient of mine that I treated with the laparoscopic sacroisteropexy. I did a laparoscopy on a few of them because some of them were reporting of um, uh, pain. And as you can see, this is the uterus. You cannot even see the mesh on top of the uterus. This is the second case. You can see the protac here. And again, here you can see the suture, the stitch here that they used to suspend the mesh, uh, to attach the mesh on the uterus. So if this is, let's move now to the surgical technique. This is a surgical technique as I performed it, the procedure. I put four ports, an umbilical port, a suprapubic port, and two lateral port. I, the first thing that I do, I normally use this, introduce the mesh, and I fix the mesh. The first step are the uterosacral ligament. So, I use normally etibon suture and I try to attach the mesh as flat as possible to the uterus. The number of sutures, the stitches that I use to attach this mesh to the uterus varies depending on the size of the uterus. The mesh is attached from the uterosacral ligament to the posterior uterine wall and to the fundus of the uterus. I don't Cover, I don't know, I stop open the anterior peritoneum to dissect the bladder because I stop attaching my mesh on the anterior uterine wall. Normally, I attach my mesh simply on the posterior uterine wall and the uterus. You can use internal knot, you can use external knot, it doesn't matter. I prefer to use external knot because it's easy for me to control the tension of my uh, knot. I use a J needle, as you can see, because I want to be sure when I put my stitch that I take a full thickness bite. So I want to be sure that this mesh stay on the uterus. As you can see, the mesh is anchored on the uterus. The number of suture varies. Then I move to the sacral promontory. I open the peritoneum of the sacral promontory. Some authors will say probably you should open the sacral promontory be, uh, as the first step prior to attach the uh, mesh to the uh, uterus, but is very subjective. I try to do a minimal dissection of the sacral promontory to identify the anterior longitudinal ligament. I try to identify the vascular uh, structure the common iliac vein, as well as the ureter, that without putting too much tension, I use protac to suspend my mesh on the sacral promontory. And again, this is the last step when I cover only the peritoneum on top of my protac. Uh, the reason why, because the only complication that I had was a bowel, uh, a fistula of the small bowel, because the small bowel got attached into on top of the uh, protac. So I try to cover the titanium, the protac with peritoneum, but I don't cover the mesh itself. So this is the technique. I hope uh, it's clear. I use Vicro to cover. As you can see, the is about two centimeter. The the uncover mesh that is left. Well, what are the landmarks? The anatomical landmark is of the mid-sacral promontory. This is the mid-sacral promontory. And obviously, the important structure that we need to bear in mind is the median sacral artery, is the right common iliac artery, the left common iliac vein, the ureter, and the S1 nerve because all these structures are found within three centimeters from the mid sacral promontory. So we have to be very careful. These are two interesting studies that you can read 
where the anatomy of the precycloid space has been studied on 52 fresh frozen cadavers or 25 fresh frozen cadavers. This study is very useful if you want to learn more about the anatomy. What about the uh, anatomical landmarks are important to reduce the risk of complication. The most common complication are M the bleeding and ureteral injury that has been reported to be between four and one percent. Obviously, this uh, complication occurred during the dissection of the precycle space and the uh, peritoneum of the uh, patch of Douglas. That's the reason why I stopped doing that wide dissection of the peritoneum of the patch of Douglas. And just only if we know and uh, understand well the extensive variability in the vascular urethral anatomy relative to the mid circle promontory, we can avoid serious intraoperative complication. The first take home message obviously is to fix, probably I like to fix no more on the sacral promontory, but on S1, my mesh. The reason why is because the left common iliac vein, it might be as close as nine millimeter from the mid sacral promontory. And the fact that the vein has no pulsatility make it very uh, vulnerable to any injury during the dissection or during the attachment of the mesh. That's the reason why I try to move a bit away from the mid circular promontory, attach on the circular, first circular vertebra. By attaching to the circular vertebra, we reduce the risk of osteomyelitis. And if we attach on the S1, we also provide, in my opinion, a better access to the vagina um, and the uterus. Uh, some authors where I say that probably we should start the, the section of the peritoneum at the level of circular promontory and move downwards. And to avoid intraoperative or delay injury to this structure, everyone should identify the ureter at the beginning uh, throughout the entire course of the dissection. We, if we decide to attach the mesh to the circular promontory or the S1 using needle, we should visualize the entry the exit point of the needle through the ligament. And finally, we, when we do the dissection of the peritoneum and the exposure of the anterior longitudinal ligament of the sacrum before the suture placement, we should try to minimize any potential life-threatening uh, vascular complication because uh, these are not uncommon. I've uh, finished with my presentation. I hope you find this presentation and this technique easy to perform. Um, and I thank you for all your attention. Thank you, Alex. Very nice presentation. And uh, can you stop sharing, please? Yes. Excellent. Thank you. So, Maybe we'll have a couple of questions. So let me see what we have. Okay, I have a question uh, for you, Alex. Sure. Uh, can you consider that the sacrocolpopexy technique could be the gold standard technique for the pelvic organ prolapse for, uh, to treat uh, pelvic organ prolapse for women? In my opinion, uh, this is my personal opinion, the best technique or the gold standard technique, sacrocopopexy, we're talking about the uh, suspension of the vault, right? Because if we talk about suspension of the cystus in other rectus, and probably the sacrocopopexy is not the best technique to perform. So in my opinion, is the best technique to perform to suspend the vault is the one where uh, the surgeon is more confident, familiar, and happy with the outcome. So if as a surgeon, I'm not happy with my outcome, that is not the gold standard. If we are all happy with our outcome in uh, respect of sacrocolpopexy or sacrospinous ligament fixation, in my opinion, the best technique is the one that suits and meet the patient um, need. So in our decision uh, plan, we have to get the patient involved and let also the patient to decide. So if you're good in doing sacral carpopexy, carry on doing that. If you're good doing sacrospinous ligament fixation, you've got great result, carry on doing that. That is the gold standard for you. If you're a good surgeon, you can perform both as the patient, what they prefer after you inform what are the advantages and disadvantages. Okay, thank you. And another question for Emery. Uh, Emery, can you hear me? Yes, Sharif, I hear you. Okay, the question is, can we use, or how can you use the model 
technology techniques or models in the preoperative evaluation of the patients before surgeries? Um, thank you, Sheriff. I think this is a very good question because this is the feature, especially if we need to take into account because uh, as a surgical planning, uh, we know that the, 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 the complex anatomy we have in pelvic and perineal region, uh, the technology can be used, especially uh, with using the CT or MRI scan. And then we can uh, reconstruct the CT scan if we will uh, if we need to know more anatomic knowledge about the soft tissue, about the, uh, the heart tissue, like a uh, bone, okay? And for uh, MRI scan will be helpful for uh, soft tissue, especially uh, the secondary cases, the vesicovaginal fistula, and also you show excellent 3D CT reconstruction to check the, the urethral anatomy in appropriate, uh, if, the, if the, the urethra is appropriate or not. So this will be helpful for to do the surgery before the live surgery. And we can do the surgery as a virtually, and then we can do it afterward as a live surgery. This will, this will be helpful. Also, we have some literature, but the literature comes not from the functional urology, especially more prostate and the kidney cancer. So uh, the report shows the efficacy of the preoperative surgical planning in virtual reality, uh, virtual uh, the 3D uh, models. However, and now uh, we are still working on uh, the, the sacral neuromodulation application, especially creation, the, the virtual guide, uh, virtual uh, surgery, uh, especially for to increase the, the uh, to decrease the learning curve. So uh, this is the, the main uh, uh, interest, especially to use the modern technology. I can summarize the first uh, with appropriate software, 3D, 3D reconstruction of the pelvis and the pelvic organs and the, the secondary cases, uh, some complex uh, anatomy. The second one, we can convert it as a 3D printed model. And also we can use the virtual models for preoperative surgical plan planning. Uh, on the other hand, especially for the, uh, the, the medical legal issue, sometimes we are using it for also patient information uh, before the surgery or after the surgery. So the modern technology probably will be the uh, really uh, more common the, in near future in functional female sur surgery. Very good. Thank you very much. I think because we don't have uh, enough time uh, for more questions, so I want to thank the panel for today. And please look at the ics.org slash live for other upcoming live events which are being put on, the, on by the ICS during this lockdown period. Thank you for the ICS office for preparing and organizing all these webinars. And uh, before I, I finish, I want to hear the closing opinion or remarks from Emery and Alex. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Sherif. I uh, also thanks to a really great work for ICS office, uh, although the unprecedented times. So this great honor for me. Thank you. Thank you, Emery. Yes. And again, for me, thank you to uh, has to invite me also to be part of this faculty. Thank you to all the ICS office. Without them, this could not happen. And I think in these uh, COVID time, uh, education is important and should carry on. And we can continue educating our fellow only if we go virtually. Um, I hope you find all our presentation useful. If you have any question, please reach the ICS office or reach us directly. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you to everyone. And let's meet again. So bye bye. 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 Bye bye.